as we begin to talk about the principles of natural selection that lead to all of these adaptations we already looked at, it's important that first we understand how to define evolution. Evolution, by definition, we can say right here, changes in the gene pool of a population over time. Okay? So a couple of important things to notice here. Evolution does not happen to an individual, and it doesn't happen instantaneously. But evolution occurs in entire populations over long periods of time, and it's changes in the gene pool, or the genes, the alleles that are available. So that's what's being illustrated here. Okay? So we have, think about each one of these ovals represents a different individual. Some of them are homozygous, those are the ones that are the same color. Some of them are heterozygous, so have two different colors, like green and blue, or pink and blue. Um, and when, if we total up all of the X1 alleles versus the X2 versus the X3, et cetera, that would represent the gene pool. And as those genes change, as the availability of different alleles changes um, due to evolution, that's what we're talking about. So we're going to look at how that occurs in this video. Um, another thing, important thing to keep in mind when we're talking about evolution is that all organisms descend from a common ancestor which is kind of what we can see here. So right here would be our first organism that ever appeared on Earth. And then we get all of these different organisms that have kind of branched out, and that we'll get into later on. We can't discuss evolution and natural selection without talking about the great Charles Darwin. Um, so this picture here shows him later in life, but um, when he was a young man in 1835, he traveled on the British ship, the HMS Beagle. He was the ship's naturalist. And he was on board the ship for five years, and they traveled around a good part of the earth. Um, but he found the most inspiration from the Galapagos Islands, which are located off the coast of Ecuador. Um, and when he came home, he spent almost the next two decades pondering everything that he saw and he brought home hundreds and hundreds of specimens as well. And he developed the theory of natural selection and finally pub published his book on the origin of species, but not until 1859, because at the time, um, in the mid-19th century, this idea of evolution and of humans descending from ancestors that were around millions of years ago was, and that the earth was very old, this was still quite a controversial subject. One of the things that Darwin was most inspired by in the Galapagos Islands were all of the different species of finches that he saw. Finches are birds, um, and he saw similar species of finch on the mainland in South America, but then he found all these different species on the different islands in the Galapagos. He thought, wow, how did they all become so different? And this is one of the things that led him to develop his theory of natural selection. Charles Darwin only used the term natural selection on one of the very last pages of On the Origin of Species. But I want you to take a moment right now and write down this definition. So natural selection is the process by which those characteristics that permit survival and reproduction are continued and eventually replace less advantageous characteristics. So pretty much every day when we're talking about evolution, you are going to hear me say these two words, survive and reproduce. And you should be using these words, okay? Survive and reproduce. So natural selection is the process by which things that help individuals survive and reproduce are going to become more common within that population, I'm going to change that gene pool so that those alleles that allow for survival and reproduction become more common to lots of individuals. So the first principle of natural selection is the idea that variation exists, okay? So individuals in a given species vary. And we've talked about sources of variation through sexual reproduction and during meiosis crossing over occurs. There's the law of independent assortment. And then we have mutations too. So even asexually reproducing populations do have variation. So not everyone's alike. So you can think about all the differences among the individuals in a species and how those differences, those, that variation can affect how organisms survive and reproduce. The second principle is heritability. 
the idea that these variations that exist can be passed on. So if you think about everything we've been doing with genetics, they're not just these random things that people learn how to do or organisms learn how to do, but it's involved in the genes, it's involved in the DNA that's being passed on from one generation to the next. Third principle of natural selection is overpopulation. And this one I think is probably the most confusing um, to students. But what this means is that not everyone survives. So organisms produce more offspring than are going to survive generally. This is one of those examples when humans are to some extent an exemption because most human babies now in the 21st century do survive to adulthood. Um, but not always the case in if we look at developing countries or if, if we traveled back 100 years. So this still falls under that category. So why do organisms produce more offspring than will actually survive? It increases the general chance of survival. Um, we can see good examples of this in the animal world with mosquitoes and fish and all of these organisms that produce, you know, for example, these fish eggs. You know, thousands of fish eggs, most of them won't make it. Most of those eggs won't develop into fish that will live long enough to find a mate and reproduce. Or if you ever cut up any sort of fruit or vegetable and you look at all of those seeds, if I threw this tomato in my backyard in the fall and then in the summer went back to that same spot, I wouldn't find 200 tomato plants there, but I might find one or two from the seeds of that tomato. The final principle of natural selection is the idea of reproductive advantage. So this is when we get the idea of survive and reproduce, right? So the, we say the fittest, is that quotes, the fittest individuals will survive and reproduce. Fittest does not mean strongest. Okay, so when you hear that term survival of the fittest, don't think that's necessarily the strongest or even the fastest or the smartest, but which individuals are more likely to live long enough to pass on their DNA to their ne the next generation, to the offspring. The idea of competition is very important here, specifically intraspecific. Intra means within, right? Think intramural sports. So intraspecific competition is competition amongst individuals within the same population, competing for limited resources, competing for mates, etc. So gorillas are a great example because only the alpha male mates within a kind of gorilla family. None of the other males are mating. So what are the characteristics that allow that alpha male to survive and reproduce? Those get passed on to his offspring. I'm going to leave you now with this image of my alma mater, Bowdoin College, our polar bear mascot. Um, but here's the question I want you to ponder, to think about. Why are polar bears white? And don't just give me an answer that a fourth grader could give. But thinking about the principles of natural selection, why are polar bears white? How did that happen?